<laughs> Manuel. I do. Hi, over to you to, I, you yeah. know, I, for life of me, I've forgotten what your title actually is, but I'm sure your first slide has it written on there in big, bold letters. Yes, it has. Oh, magic. You oh, can let me you know if you've seen it. Projects, a student-centered project. I am looking forward to this, Emmanuel. So over to you, please. Okay. Um, firstly, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to, uh, to you all today. It's a fantastic network. And uh, I also want to especially thank Ian for actually introducing me to Dry Labs Real Science. Uh, we met at the Education Strategy Forum. And um, I think what I'm going to talk about today is actually one of the, the key things that I actually saw within that space. Some of the things that a lot of the attendants were particularly looking for, support around student, uh, the, student, the student engagement, but particular support around widening participation and the awarding gap. So this really helps in the sense that you might be wondering why I'm thinking projects as a way to actually address some of the conversations, but we'll get to, to that point at some point. Um, I'm a uh, deputy of the department at the University of the West of England. So my role is uh, sci I'm also a scientist, my biologist, um, but I also do quite a bit of administrative, um, administrative work. Okay. Um, and for those who don't know UWE Bristol, uh, UWE Bristol is a, it's a very big university in, in the city of Bristol. And if you've never been to Bristol, this is our Clifton Suspension Bridge. Uh, so this is a, a place I would normally say to people, if you're visiting the city, uh, will be a good space to try and uh, engage with because uh, it's, a, it's a place we normally take everyone to who visits Bristol for the first time. So you're welcome to Bristol. And this presentation is, is coming to you from Bristol. So what I will be talking about is just going through the different project types, the types of projects that we offer within the department, um, and then going into the student-centered approach, which I use, and something which I have been sharing across uh, faculty, but also a bit wider across the university as a model to be able to get students engaged, but also supporting the individual student and how it leads to effective outcomes or, or, or useful outcomes for the students at the end of the experience. And then I'll be sharing a couple of case studies uh, from the approach which I use in working with student uh, uh, undergraduate research projects. Um, within the department, we have, we typically have always had um, the experimental approach to doing research for students. Uh, so, and this is typically lab-based projects, 10 weeks in the lab. I've watched several of the videos um, from the Dry Labs Real Science Group, and I think we typically have similar models for the undergraduate projects. And we also offer dry projects, but we did find that during the pandemic, there was an increase in the number of dry projects. We've seen that jump go from a smaller number to almost an equal number of students within the department who are doing dry projects along, uh, as opposed to doing the experimental projects. And some of these projects include systematic reviews, um, surveys, secondary data analysis, and focus groups. Um, what we did find was during the pandemic, there was, a, there was a panic at some point because people were starting to think, well, I've always done laboratory-based projects and now students can't be in the lab, what can I actually do? And I think having a space like this where we talk about different types of projects and different models that people use is really useful. In terms of the assessment, we, we normally look at a progression report, which is a proposal. We expect students to put a proposal together and then we get them to do a poster and then we assess the posters with an oral defense. In different universities, it might be that they defend their final uh, piece of writing. Uh, we do also get them to write a research journal journal paper, almost like an article, just to get that as, as part of the final assessment, which is where the, the stronger the stronger elements in terms of the marking tends to be. But in terms of the outcomes, it's not too dissimilar from what we're looking for across different institutions. We want them to be able to search for literature. We want them to be able to differentiate between types of data. And you find when you're working with undergraduate students who are in the biosciences, this tends to be a particular challenge because when you start talking to our systematic reviews, you find students thinking they need to go and get the data or collect the data rather than actually working with existing literature. So it's how do we get them to understand these differences uh, in terms of primary and secondary or tertiary data, very important. Critical, um, critical thinking, critical review of literature, formulating questions, hypotheses, all of these things that we would normally expect from final year projects are the things that we have as part of our learning outcomes. So then, um, for me, one of the things that really, uh, really struck me during the pandemic was, like I said, the the. I, I actually don't, don't want to really say the lack of confidence, but there's a lack of confidence even within the biosciences space for the different options of projects, particularly when it comes to social sciences. The increasing number of uh, social science uh, methods that we're using 
in our dry projects are things that a lot of bioscientists are not typically um, uh, exposed to. And my colleague, former colleague and I, Viv Rove, wrote, wrote about this in terms of the different types of um, projects that we will be looking at moving forward in the future. Um, the virtual labs is something that might end up being um, uh, an area that a lot of people are looking at for projects and giving students as, as projects, simulations might be potential opportunities for projects. Open education resources. So I know there's a bigger open education community and that could also prove to be a, a good space for people to be able to source projects to, to give students to do. Um, in terms of using data sets, which if you look at the example of the COVID-19 databases and how we use that data and how a lot of people use that data and expose to that data, that actually offers opportunities for people to offer students projects as well as we move forward. And data sets like that might be useful for students to be able to do projects and for staff to be able to identify new project opportunities for students. Um, and one that I just really wanted to particularly highlight the work by Dave Lewis, who I just checked wasn't is not actually here today, but his work around the capstone projects was really, really useful because actually what else one of the things we used in actually working with staff in the department uh, in terms of the types of projects that he offers. So for anyone who hasn't seen the, the recording, it is on the dry labs uh, network and i think it's something that people really need to engage with their different types of projects which will be very useful for people to look at um, we have particularly increased our work on systematic reviews within the space offering that to students very early on now in terms of skills development before they get into final year because what we did find were students pro producing systematic reviews in the final year without any prior exposure to systematic reviews they didn't really produce good quality systematic reviews so we are now doing early work in skills modules to be able to get students into those sort of spaces and one thing that uh, Viv and I are currently working on are remote internships, because one of the things we've trialed out for about five, six years is actually how these remote internships can be a useful way to get final year projects in, but also undergraduate research developed. And that's something which we've been doing quite a lot of work on, and hopefully we should get something out there to pu uh, for, for publication pretty soon. But that's one of the areas that might be changing as well, because speaking to employers, employer viewpoints are, well, we, we could we could actually do a bit more of this with these remote internships. And that's something that I think universities might need to pay, pay a bit more attention to as we look at how COVID has impacted our, um, our research landscape as well. So I think for anyone who is interested, you'll be able to find this paper on um, uh, general biological education. It was published last year. But I thought actually it'd be useful just in terms of putting context that I do laboratory research. So I work with on antimicrobial resistance and my own interest is actually looking at conventional alternative methods to um, managing infectious diseases. Uh, so we would do a lot of work with uh, bacterial pathogens and fungal pathogens. Um, very interested in exploit and how we can exploit plants for health benefits. So one of the things I do is actually working with different companies on either uh, herbal products or looking at bioavailability of herbal products. And the pharmacokinetics of some of these different products, we do some of this sort of work within within the within the lab here. Um, but in recent years, a lot of this I've been taught in the sort of public health, MSc public health programs for a number of years. Actually, that element of the social science and the intertwining between social science and the biological science of biomedical sciences is really important. And you find that the biomedical science students are not very strong in terms of the social science side and the social science public health students and not particularly strong on the bioscience side. So we've been doing quite a lot of work in actually bridging that gap in terms of knowledge between those two sides and also introducing new modules to be able to get our undergraduate applied sciences students to have a bit more understanding of how their work in the labs connect to the wider community and the wider society. And that's also improving in terms of the, the appreciation of what students are doing in the projects. That's something we've seen uh, growing in recent years. But um, for me, the, the inquiry-based research and pedagogic research into widening participation, inclusivity, and the graduate outcomes are things which I've been doing some work on in the last few years based on some of the roles that I've had, but also based on my, my other wider interests. So that being said, the real question for me, which I really wanted to pose, and I'm, while I'm talking about it, I'm also posing as a question, um, is what exactly is the student-centered approach? and why should we even think about it as an important? And I think this image should really give us a, a context to that. Looking at that picture, I, when I look at a student community in the classroom, in, at the university, this is what I see. There's a diversity of students within the classroom environment. But the thing that connects the students in the classroom is that they're on that course, on that program, in that lab at that time. 
but actually what their experiences are are very different. The diversity of the students are different. The pressures the students are on are very different. And typically you find that in the biosciences, I think we've been guilty of this for many years. We have our set projects. We offer our set projects to students. We expect them to deliver on something. And at the end, we don't really know what happens beyond that project. And I think this is really important because this is what drove me into the sciences that I'm doing today, the final year project. And for me, it's always served as a model for how we work with undergraduate project students and even master's project students in delivering projects that are effective and valuable to the student. So it's really tailored to the student. And that's why I think this student-centered approach really should be an approach that we should consider even more strongly. And going through Dave's um, recording, it was really good to see that he talked about the mismatch between projects and graduate career destinations. Uh, in my previous role, I held the role of employability lead. And I could see how a lot of our students had a good experience in terms of learning. But beyond that, there wasn't really that appreciation for what next. There wasn't that understanding of actually the different areas that students could go into. And I think the final year project really does a good job in helping students shape their, their skill set, but also shape their thinking in terms of that independence to help them decide on what they're going to do next. And that's why I think it's really important that we think about this, uh, this approach a little bit, a little bit more. Um, and as I was doing my, my preparation, I was thinking about um, this student-centered learning. And actually, this captures the approach that I take. Uh, with my student body and uh, with my project students. It is really about them doing. It's about the active learning rather than just being passive and just being passengers as, as they're given a project. Deep learning, increased responsibility and accountability. And I think when I was thinking about this, one of the things that crossed my mind is that in the minds of a lot of people will be, this is difficult. How do you get, if you have 10 project students or 15 project students, how do you get 15 project students or 10 project students to do 10 individual projects how do you get all 10 students to be responsible and accountable for the project? How, do, how can all of them be autonomous in, in their approach? But there is a way to do that. There are ways in which we can be able to achieve that when we work with project students. For me, that interdependence, and I think this is where, for me, there is, there is a different approach in terms of having the students as partners and co-creators and stakeholders. So the students are not just there to do a project. The project must be relevant to the students, and as such, if the students recognize themselves as people who are partners in that project or stakeholders in the project, it influences the nature of how that project will be delivered. And I run this uh, systematic review as a workshop for the students. And I think it struck the students, bioscience students, the first time I mentioned the whole stakeholder analysis as a project. And for many of them, the first thing that crossed their minds when, they, when I asked them what I meant by stakeholder was business, investing in a business, but actually not seeing themselves as the stakeholder in that environment. But the moment they were able to understand that as students sitting in the classroom, they are stakeholders, which means if they're doing a project, they're stakeholders in a project, it changed the perspective of what the students actually were going to do and actually the sort of ways they saw their projects as valuable to them. And I think that's an approach that I am constant, I'm going to be continue to, um, to promote as a student, the students as stakeholders in the final year project. So how I do this is I focus it around three areas. We have the learning outcomes from the final year project, which is a specific learning, uh, specific project outcomes. And these are the things that actually, one of the things that are quite core. Cool. Are, are we expecting the students to understand how to deliver a project, how to search for literature? Yes, all of those things are really important. But then how does that project connect to the student's eventual destination? We know that uh, graduate outcomes and employability is a very key performance, in, is very important performance indicator for how well our programs are. But actually for the student, what does it mean? Um, is the student seeing the project as a way to get to the next uh, step in their career? Are they thinking about doing a master's program? Are they thinking of going into a PhD? Are they thinking of working in industry? Are they thinking of not working in science? The student might actually say, science is not for me. So how do we design a project that works for a student who doesn't want to have science as an eventual career? And then what personal outcomes? Um, in my work in widening participation, this is a very important element because some students come to university as a first in their families to go to university. For some students, just going to university is the success that they're looking for. For some students, it's beyond going to first, having a first degree. So how can the project be designed in a way that actually meets the student at the need that they're trying to get to? And that's the approach which I take with working with the project students. 
And how I do this is once we have normally have a, a sort of a period of selection. So there's a list that goes out to students with different project titles and different project areas. Once the students actually identify the research, the different areas, they get in touch with academic staff who just say, okay, this is my project. You have a chance to go. But I tend to do what I call a pre-selection assessment. And this pre-selection assessment discusses with the student in an interview format to understand the student. How has the student performed in previous years? What are the student motivations to doing the final year project? Are they stronger in, in uh, experimental or do they prefer to do a, a dry project? And have they had experience of doing a lab-based project and would prefer to do something which is more dry-based to get multiple different types of skills? Or what exactly do they want from the project? These are the things that we normally discuss. And at the beginning of that conversation, once there is an agreement that a student goes, is coming to work with me on my team, we then have a learning agreement, which runs throughout the project. The learning agreement are the expectations that I have of the student. And I've found that speaking to a lot of my students, and I'll give one or two examples later on, this is one of the things that the students have spoken about the most, that it was important that there was an expectation. Without the expectation, they're just doing a project. With an expectation, there was a bit of accountability on their part that they needed to deliver on a project. And that is what would be expected of them if they go into the world of work. If they're going to work, they expect it to be accountable on something, to be responsible for something. But when we don't put that into the discussion about the project, it's just a case of you do whatever you want to do, you get an outcome at the end, you go out of the door. But they've actually highlighted the importance of that learner agreement. The project selection it tends to be, sometimes we get large numbers of students and we have to identify students. For me, one of the key things around this is the diversity of the student body that I work with. I think for us to be able to achieve the um, diversity within the space, but also reducing that awarding gap, I think it's really important to, for us to be able to be bold enough to take different types of students with different characteristics within, in, into a working research uh, community. Then obviously they do the, if it does in the labs, do the lab-based work, they do the experimental stuff. Those who are working on the drive-based projects will do either systematic review, focus groups, interviews. So we offer, the, uh, offer this, these different types of projects. So they go through that phase, but within that phase, there is an intense experience that they go through, which is a research group model that I've actually pulled together for, for students for the last seven, eight years, where the undergraduate students become part of a research community. So independent is supposed to do their work, but because of that accountability and ownership of the work, they have to, in a peer community, share the work that they're doing within that space on a biweekly basis to their peers. But also, sometimes I say I spike the space. I spike the space by bringing in technical teams into that space to listen to them. These are the technical staff that meet in the labs. I bring in people from professional services to give a different audience for the students to speak about their research to, because actually it's important for them to be able to have the confidence to talk about their research to scientific groups, but also non-scientific groups, because some of their projects are actually non-scientific in, in nature. Um, sometimes I bring people from the public to listen to the students while they do their presentations. And this gives them the opportunity to actually get that skill set in dealing with different types of groups, different types of audiences. And through that, they then actually go into what I call a post-project phase, which is typically agreed in the pre-selection phase. With the students actually owning the project, what can the projects lead to? And part of that is, is that project leading to um, just getting your classification at the end? Is it about getting the first class in your project? Is it about producing good quality science that can lead to a poster. So we normally expect them to do a poster, but actually can the students do a good piece of work that can lead to a poster beyond their time at the university? Or if they are able to do a good piece of work, what is the agreement we have potentially if they want to publish that work? Is that something that is discussed at the beginning? I think sometimes those conversations come in too late, but actually having the conversations with the students at the beginning of the, the learning journey is something that the students then determine, it actually helps the student determine how to plan their work, manage their work, and eventually leads to the kind of outcomes that I've experienced with a lot of my project students. So some of the case studies I wanted to use uh, to describe this, to discuss this, which, which, um, which I'm talking about, one of them is for a project student I had in 2018 called Brody. Brody is currently a senior epidemiologist in uh, Public Health England, obviously, um, uh, with a name change recently. And the project she was looking at was systematic review. But it was quite interesting that this was a very uh, good good student who had good experience in the lab, had lab skills, wanted to do stuff in the lab, 
but actually her interest was actually traveling. Her main interest was traveling. So she wanted to have a career that would give her the flexibility and the opportunity to travel outside the UK. And she felt that that was her passion. That's what she wanted to do. And at that time, we were just coming out of the Ebola epidemic. And the conversation was, actually, if you want a career that will give you more flexibility to do the traveling side, have you thought about maybe a career in public health or global health? And through those discussions, we ended up on a topic which was around a pressing issue at that time. The discussion then centered around how do you develop the skill sets to be able to do the kind of work that you would need? We talked about a systematic review. We talked about surveys. We settled on a systematic review. And all of these things took different conversations to get to that eventual agreement on this is what the project will be. These are the skills you're going to need and how you're going to actually approach doing the work. And with that, Brody carried on with doing a systematic review, producing a systematic review. Um, and that work led to the job that she did because by the time she finished doing the, the, the first degree, um, prior to starting her master's program, she applied for an interview at Public Health England and was expected to write a case report on Ebola on the Ebola virus disease as the assessment for the job uh, across the panel. And that was actually what eventually led to her getting the job in Public Health England. And I think it was really important because those conversations were the things that actually led to her decision making in terms of, so she actually did a, a master's in public health, getting the distinction in master's in public health, where she actually focused on using a different method set, which was going to evaluate the countries that she looked at in the systematic review with surveys. She actually did quite very large surveys in three different countries, evaluating the experiences of people during the pandemic, during the epidemic at that time, uh, looking at that, and has since carried on working on the most recent pandemic, doing similar work and also producing um, uh, papers. But it was actually, where, where did the work lead to? That was the first time that a student, undergraduate student in the department had written a systematic review as a part of a project and published it. So this work was published in the Journal of Public Health. So she presented the work at an internal, internal conference, part of the agreements that we have at the beginning. If you do a good quality project, then the project can go into a poten potentially into a conference. That led to a paper and got listed in the CDC's list of health communication, things around, the, around pandemics at that time, now included as part of what we use in developing students within the department, because then students can see there is, there's a role model here. A student has published a piece of work from a systematic review, so it gives us an incentive that we can do this. I had a student recently email me saying, I spoke to someone in a different university and I was told that, oh yeah, systematic review is too big for undergraduate students to do. And I thought, well, that's a wrong message. What we need to do is to do is to say, actually, these are the tools that you need. This is how you can go about doing this work. And this is where it can lead you to. And I've just pulled up something from our, our Blackboard page around the, 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 the dissertation project where we now used her, we now had recordings of this student talking about how to actually do a dissertation project. What are the models that you can use and how do you go about de designing a project and running through the project and what are the steps you need to take? This student has also then run a session for staff on how to supervise students on dissertation projects if you're going to do a systematic review. So you can see how one final year project led to multiple outcomes for a singular project. And we've also recently done a podcast on the student supervisor, managing student supervisor relationship lead to lead to an outcome. And that's something which you can see one project, and these are just the five that could fit on this page. The, the outcomes from this particular project were quite extensive. So there are multiple uh, um, outcomes from this particular project. So this is just one of the case studies I was going to, to mention. The second one is actually how through the projects, you can help students build confidence, build that community, but also how it might actually be one of the ways we can start to look at tackling the awarding gap. So I've used this model in the last five years in the department as a way to talk, uh, tackle the awarding gap. And what it's done is that most of the students within that space found it a very friendly, welcoming space that sometimes I showed up into the presentation room and instead of having six to eight students, I had 25 students in the room. Sometimes I had 30 students in the room. And I was wondering where the students were coming from. But actually, many of the students found that peer-to-peer -peer support as very important for them, that they were bringing other students who were not experiencing the same uh, approach to be in that same space, to experience what it was like for them, to help them design their own projects and also deliver their own projects. 
And I think in my initial conversation with, with Nigel, I think there's something Nigel mentioned about how did you transition the approach to the vet during the pandemic? Initially, this is what it normally looked like. We have the students every couple of weeks stand in front of the room and they give a two week update. I've been in the lab, I've been doing this in the lab. This, this is my data, I've analyzed my data. This, these are my findings. These are the experimental. And then the students are expected to challenge the data, ask questions about the data. And as you can see, we have a large room there. But what you might not know in that room is, in that room, we have industry. So industry partners, my industry partners get invites several times a year to the space. Um, my research partners get invites into the space. My colleagues get invites into the space. And all of them form part of the conversation where the students are building that confidence. They're learning to speak to the audience. And in the middle picture, we actually had an, a visit from the deputy mayor of the city into the room from a previous conversation of, it would be nice for you to come and see what the students are doing at the University of the Sciences. And suddenly one day we got a surprise visit to one of these presentations, which actually led to the students feeling empowered in that space to talk about their research. As you can see, some of them eventually went to conferences, presented internal, internal conferences and external conferences. Several of the students actually won national uh, awards from different societies through that project. But one which really was very useful, very, very important, was actually the students feeling even more confident for the, to talk about science to the media. So this, these were students who were actually on the radio and captured in the new, local newspaper talking about their science, straight from the project team to the public. And that's something which is really important. And there's some, one of the statements from the students was about confidence. So we, we have a, a manuscript which we've recently submitted around evaluating this exper the experience of the students. And the students talked about confidence, improve their confidence, providing utility for their own work. And it was actually about learning a skill rather than just being passive. And if we look at the, the, the elements of the student-centered learning, it's about active learning rather than passive learning. And this is something which the students had communicated about. So the question now is how are we taking this forward? One of the things which um, we are doing in the department is working with our colleagues in the library to design a platform to provide students with the opportunity, which, which some students are seeing on the Blackboard pages, but how can we make it a bit more wider, department-wide and potentially faculty-wide? So we're designing this platform where students can be able to see what other students have done before, so stuff we don't see on the Blackboard page, but actually having a, a space where to their own tips, they can go into that space, see how to write. How do you write a research paper? How do you write a proposal? How, where can you, if you get a good piece of work done, can you actually publish it? You don't need to say to your supervisors, well, I, I need to publish. And then, because we know our supervisors, we're very busy, but actually the student is empowered enough to be able to see what other students are doing around the globe then that's, that empowers the students to be able to know, I have the utility to be able to ask the questions of where this information is, what I can do to publish, if my work is good, how can I do this? And there are other students across the group I can speak to about this. And part of that is also providing materials for these students to be able to watch in their own time on different types of projects. So the same way we're doing in Dry Labs Real Science here, there is actually a platform which has been built for the students on the different types of project, project methodologies and how to approach different projects. So these are some of the things that are now coming through from that student-centered design, now for a bit, getting a bit more wider to engage a lot more students within the space. And for me, it's really about that added value to the projects. And this is a question that I, I wanted to pose to you. Um, I have seen a reduction in my department of the awarding gap for the last five years. Um, and one of the things that I know that has contributed to because we've evaluated this is the fact that we are getting a lot more students into this sort of space and engaging with a lot more students, especially in the final year. And what we've seen is a great increase for the students who are coming to that room because their actions within that space impacted on their other modules, that there was an uplift in their other modules across the department, across um, the program. So that's something which I'm trying to encourage other colleagues to think about. When we get project students to work with, we have an opportunity. And that opportunity is something that can actually do more than just getting the students a grade. It's an opportunity that actually has far-reaching uh, um, um, uh, uh, outcomes for the students, but also for us, because even from a point of view of publishing, we become partners with our students as, as co-publishers, as, as co-authors. And I think that is a really good opportunity that we can we could also look at. So this is what I wanted to share. And I think it was sort of informed by some of the conversations I had with Ian, but also uh, something which I think is very, very core cool to my, 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 my experience as an academic 
but something that I think hopefully will be very useful and beneficial to, to the listeners today. So thank you very much for your invitation and I look forward to taking any questions uh, in the audience. Wonderful, thank you, Emmanuel. That's really amazing stuff. Um, we have lots of questions in the chat and they're, they're sort of, um, I'm doing a little thematic analysis of it all. They fall into three little themes. Um, so I'll just go back up to Nigel's one, which is dropped off the, dropped off the page as I like, try not to choke on the mint I just put in. Um, right at the start, for to begin with, tonight, one it says, when you say you're using virtual labs, do you mean students developing resources or more the use of commercial packages combined together to replicate a lab experience? And then there's quite a few questions about your delivery and um, the awarding app stuff coming through as well. So I'm just trying to get myself back on screen again. Um, there you go. There we are, fabulous. I have the power. Yeah. So for the virtual labs, it's I think at that time, we're looking at what resources were available. Can we provide, can we identify existing resources? So you have a lot of organizations that are providing virtual lab um, for, uh, infrastructure. And it's whether we could use, whether we could develop stuff that could go, that could be based on projects or whether we could use existing virtual lab components to actually help students design projects. And that's what we're looking at in that space. And it's something which is still quite a newish area. No virtual labs have existed, but actually to think about it in the context of finding a project. Because one of the things we did uh, during the pandemic was use a lot of virtual uh, content for students to learn how to do lab-based projects. So it might be that we might do virtual labs doing some of the sampling work and actually giving the students as a way to then take on that stuff and then go design the projects or analyze the data from that virtual lab. So these are things that could potentially be alternatives that can be looked at there as well. Excellent. Um, question from Michael, well, a number of questions from Michael, but we'll group them together a little bit. Um, do you feel there are greater challenges implementing student-centered learning projects at master's level than with a cohort that have um, that's been on the course for the prior two years? That's a really good question. And it's something which um, I have also tried. So I have master's students within that space. Um, depends on the master's students. So if you have master's students who might who do not have the UK background, it's tougher. It's tougher because the experience might be very different and it might be a bit more challenging for them. But I still take the same approach with those master's students, bringing them with, into that space. So they still get mentored because I have my PhD students come into the space and offer some peer-to-peer -peer mentoring for those master's students. But I think the challenge sometimes is with master's level students, you might just have one or two master's students as, as opposed to having more undergraduate students. So there is a challenge there, but I've seen it work successfully with master's students. I have several master's students who have now gone on to PhDs or gone on to industry who have come into that space and found it really useful. And what we find is they come back. So a lot of the students you've seen on the picture actually have been coming back for the last three years to by monthly every two months or every three months, they come in to actually support the new group of students. So that's yeah. something which included, and that includes the master's students who come back to do that. Fantastic. Um, so a couple of questions around the interviews and the the approach of, of doing it. So um, I started off with, would you offer that uh, interviews to all the students? The students who contact me. The students who contact you, okay. Yeah. So the students are expected to contact us. So it's um, an opt-in model. So it's an opt-in model. So they contact us and say, okay, I've seen your project. I want to speak to you about your project. And what I try to do is actually have those conversations. It might be a short 30 minute chat, but that 30 minute chat is really focused around the student. So it's what, what, what is your background, prior, prior background? What are their career interests and what skills do they really want to gain? So those are the three areas that I sort of focus on, but it's really about trying to figure out a bit more about the student, what actually motivates the student. So I'll give an example. One of my current project students the project the students looking on is how students actually might have lost motivation to learn during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that's because the students said, well, I just struggled. And I really want to know whether this is the same experience of all the students. And that's how we designed the project based on that. So it's really working on what works for the student and what the student really wants to do as well as part of that project. Okay. So um, a conversation occurred between Noel and Michael as you're going on. Oh, Michael's put his hand up. Michael, do you want to ask your questions directly? Um, no, really, I just wanted to check something, and apologies, I'm not trying to take over in any way. No, I, no, just no, wondered, um, I love what you're doing, um, Emmanuel. Are you the only one who's doing this, or is this throughout the um, department or um, faculty? Thank you, Michael. Well, I have been the one doing this model, the only person doing this, but I've now shared it across 
um, and other people are starting to come in. So I bring other academics in to watch what I do um, so that they can also take that approach and, and learn. So I've now shared this in the community of practice at the university and seeing how other people can pick up this approach. And, and there's no problem with um, parity of experience for the students? Because I'm the just student. thinking ahead, if we tried this, it would be, well, why are you doing this and no one else is? And they do tend to talk to each other a lot. Yes. And I just wondered whether that was an issue. It's happened. I, I will say it's happened where students have said, well, Dr. Aduku is doing this, but the others are not doing this. Uh, different different supervisors have different approaches. I, what I And I think sometimes people think the approach I take might take a lot more time. What I would have found, it takes less time than if I was meeting the students individually. So if I meet the students every two weeks and they did a 10 minute presentation, if I have six students in one hour, we've gone through six presentations with questions, with interactions, and that's one hour to see six students. Instead of actually arranging meetings to see six different students, we are actually, have, and the difference is they get to have questions from more than one person. So they're getting questions from me, they're getting questions from their peers. And if there's someone else who is another scientist in the room or a technical member of staff, they get questions that they will typically not get, uh, which helps them when they go to their defense, which helps them when they go to present in the poster somewhere else. These are the things that have been the advantages. And I, what we found is other colleagues have actually said, I hear you doing this. How do you do this? Uh, can I come in and see what you're doing? So I've now had many colleagues actually come into the room um, to see what the process is like and see how they can ad adapt it to what fits their own style of um, delivery. And I guess, and I will shut up after this, I promise. I guess it's also valuable for the students because it's not just you and the student. They get to see, oh, other students aren't perfect yet. It's not just yeah. me. Other students are going through the same things. It's not just me. When yeah. it's that solo meeting, which can be beneficial, it's also quite, well, is it just me who didn't do this quite right. Seeing other people at the same stage, I guess, is positive for them. There, there are, that's a really important point. And I've seen, and one of the things the student said to me, I think after one of those sessions, that when they got to graduation, was I had a student who was just very good at putting data together. And one of those early sessions, the student presented his data and none of the other students wanted to present. They all decided, you know what, this is, we're just not good enough. And, he took encouragement and actually saying to the students, I'm leaving all of you in the same room, talk to each other, figure out with each other how you go about learning from each other. And what we found is this actually carries on beyond the, the, the presentation. So what he started doing was before assessments, before exams, these students actually then became a support group for each other, working with each other to think about how they actually approach doing exams, how they approach doing their stats, how they approach doing data searching. But sometimes they tell me they don't need me because they've got each other. So they will come to me when they have a major issue, but actually not when they have things that they can support each other with. So this is how it's now extended. And the fact that we have students at different years, one thing that we found was actually some of the students that are inviting first year students and second year students to come into this because they knew first and second year students who were struggling with pieces of work. So they started bringing second and first year students that they were friends to come into the space to develop confidence to do their own work. So it really has a, a, a wider um, uh, output for, for the students. The students actually benefited significantly from this, this experience. Um, Emmanuel, um, I'm gonna ask you a question because it leads on to either emptying some questions, or asking more questions. The On the basis of the interview process that you you talk for, the, uh, the talking process, do you mm -hmm. then supervise all of the students or do they get allocated to other supervisors? Um, in, in my interaction with the students, it's really just getting to, to interact with them to find out what their interests are because sometimes they might actually choose other supervisors. Yeah. They might still, so it, for them, it's a scoping exercise. I want to see whether I like, I want to work with this person or whether I don't want to work with this person. And what I also try to do is be as real uh, because sometimes that expectation might not work for a different student. That expectation might be too much for one student. And that's why I say it's really centered around that student. The student says, this is too much for me. I'm not going to do this. And I don't want this. This is not what I signed up for. It's okay. It's just making sure the student knows whatever, whatever you're going to do for your project is based on what you are able to do and your interest and what you want to achieve at the end of this. So it's really designed based on that. Okay. So that then lets some of the, one of the questions we're then talking about um, how do you then uh, deal with, with the term was used supervisor bias of people wanting all to work with the same person, for example? Um, typically, I don't present this as something which is nice. 
are presented as probably the worst thing that any of them could possibly do. <laughs> Um, so that if they have a they have a choice to run away before they actually choose to come and work with me, but what I found was this has actually gone. Uh, the students actually take the message of there is a but they know in terms of to avoid the bias. Even if I'm not their supervisor, I am not going to prevent them from coming into the space. Yeah. So that actually has tackled that because the students know they can still come. So I've had students who come into the sessions who are not my project students. The only difference is we're not just going to have one-to-one -one meetings to discuss their projects. That's the only mm -hmm. thing that is different there. But I think we have many good colleagues around who probably get more, 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 who have more selections based on their research areas, cancer research and other things that rather than microbiology, but microbiology is still good. So, um, mm -hmm. so we don't really have that problem that much here. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Michael asked the final question about um, the, the awarding gap work and I might follow up and I'll add to that depending on what the response is. And it's, it was one to know between which groups uh, you're measuring your awarding gap on this one. Okay. So in terms of the data that we collect at UE, we collect data across different demographics. So we collect data on disability, we collect data on ethnicity, we collect data on age and gender. Um, what we, where the major awarding gap is here, I would also countrywide is the ethnicity awarding gap. That's where the most significant awarding gap for ethnicity is. Um, so what we're doing, for, so part of my thinking here is if we can actually work in terms of that personalized approach with the students, we will be able to actually help the students. There are things that the students might not be able to communicate, but actually within a, a sort of student-centered approach, you get to know more, you get to hear more from the students, and which actually helps in tailoring the, the support that is needed for the students. So for me, the focus around this is actually the ethnicity awarding gap, but that's not actually taking away the fact that where there are students who might be struggling in other areas, we do identify what sort of needs they have. And for me, it also sets out what type of support that they need. So things like a list and library support is one of the things that I actually think about very early on after the first conversation. If they might need a bit more library help, they will get that. If they need more stat help, it's about signposting as well to where they will get that type of support. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really good point, Emmanuel. I mean, you're putting you you're identifying on a, on an individual basis the needs that are in place and solving those needs. And by doing yeah. that, you're you're you're, you're leveling everything up um, for everybody because yeah. you're, you're identifying the personalised needs and all of that. Wonderful. I, I, there's so many tangible things in your talk that we can we can take away and, and just get on with. Um, I'm, I'm about to email immediately after I hang up this conversation, both of our project leads going, you know, next year, when we put our project proposals up for the students to pick, link it, what, link a big list of um, careers that this project will lead to straight afterwards. Um, I think that's, it's such a simple idea. And I think that's, so, that, that's my thing I'm going to take away from all of this. And um, I have one more quick question, because I know okay. we're only scheduled till half past, and, um, but you, you talked about all this, bringing in the systematic reviews and the skill base a lot earlier. So it's a two-pronged uh, question, one from me and one from, uh, I've forgotten who it was in the chat. Um, how do you go about doing that at the earlier levels? And then for the other supervisors who don't have um, a background in doing these kind of things, how do you upskill them? Okay, so what I did, one of the things that I did a few years ago was actually, so we have skills modules. So I, I think across the different bioscience programs, we all have skills modules. It's actually bringing that into the skills module. So we do literature review, a literature review um, activity with first year students. And then, so they get to learn how to do literature reviews and learn what literature reviews are and get, have a go at doing a literature review. But in the second year, we run uh, workshops on systematic review. So it's actually not just doing a talk on systematic, but it's actually doing a workshop around systematic review where the students get to learn how to actually understanding what it is, choose, selecting questions, doing the searches themselves, going through all of that process. So that's actually quite a thorough uh, approach. And then they have videos that they can watch and the library now have a, 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 um, a page on systematic reviews that, they can, that we can also provide to them as a link for them to learn how to do that. Uh, for staff, I've, I run a learning and teaching seminar series and as mm -hmm. part of the learning and teaching seminar series, the different social science methods are part of what we actually run through. So we do quite a bit of that. Oh, we've lost him. He did say that might happen. I think he was about to tell us the answer. There's a big run as he runs. Um, staff development sessions to finish it all off. Thanks very much, David. No, really thank enjoyable. you, Manuel. There's some really good tangible ideas in that. I'm loving the uh, the interview idea. Um, I think the challenge is to do that on scale. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, um, it's, I, I realise it was really 
relevant, necessary for me because I used to have about 15 plus students who would email mm-hmm. me that they wanted to do my project. And how do you get all 15 project students and how do you know which student? And yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things I didn't want to do was just go, oh yeah, I see you have a first class in the first and second year, so I want you. Because yeah, yeah. for me, that model is also promotes the awarding gap. So I said, right, okay, let's have a conversation. Let's find out about you. So one of my the students I, that is actually the role model I use for the students was actually a very low to student in the mm-hmm. first and second year. But actually speaking to the student, the, there were barriers the students were actually facing that we were not thinking about or we're not talking about. So how do you get a student from that point? This student ended up with a first class in the final yeah. year. And the project was actually one of the best project marks that we've had around this area. So you can see how you go from just saying you'd just getting the student to think about themselves in the context of that particular project and what they can do with the project and letting the student run with it and the students coming to the end of a phd now so it's it's how do you get a student who typically would you'd look at and look at the grade and say not very good to actually you are very good but yeah, we're yeah. not asking the right questions here yeah no yeah. that's brilliant i can I, I can see locally how we could adopt what you've done we do a little thing where we um we have like a, a, a an interview, not an interview as such, but it's like a job application type stuff. We put project proposals up and they do a little application to yeah. it and then we we sift through it. But I think we had that interview stage to really get out of it and really drive them forward would be... A I, I would tell you, once it settles, it's quite scary because the students will come in and they literally just come in with a list of questions as well for me these days. And I'm like, okay, this is going to be very interesting because yeah. they're asking questions, I'm asking questions. But I, from that point, I can actually see where the potential is so every year what this has done is every year if i have five students out of the five undergraduate students there is a publication yeah in the last year during the pandemic what we've had is the students in the group decided we will write our own publication so they then invited me to their publication so i sat there thinking right the students are now owning the research i'm just saying yes and okay i want to be part of the research that you're doing so they wrote a review paper themselves um six of them i said okay we're going to put a paper together based on this research that we've done within this group and these are this is the sort of upscaling in a way that the students actually own that stuff so right now if i have situations where people are asking me about i'm looking for a student who can do a master's or do a research or phd literally all, all i just do is i just go to that bank from of those students and say right there's a project who is interested yeah. because the skill set is just embedded within those yeah. sort of students. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Yeah, I I kind of take a similar approach with my students in as much as I have give them a general topic or they choose a general topic and then I get them to own which part of the research that they're going to mm-hmm. focus on. So if I kind of work on the sort of theme of transitions is one of my kind of um, key things, transition into university, mm-hmm. and they own the kind of methodology they're going to use. They decide if they're going to look at particular groups of students, be that widening participation students or, you know, so they find their area of interest. So I think that really does help to build their engagement. But I kind of think I may do that in a bit more of a structured way rather than <laughs> how I do it right now. Yeah. I've learned something today. Thank you very much. Happy to work with anyone on anything. We're doing quite a lot around this area, just trying to find more people to just work with. Really. Yeah. So, well, you've got a group for that. We've got a group for that. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>